Hey everyone, welcome in. It is Sunday night, it's 8 p.m. Eastern, and you're in the right spot for a great conversation, some shenanigans and fun, and hopefully a great start to your week in education, whatever your important role may be. This is Brad Hughes, and my co-host tonight is the incredible, the one and only Joshua Triple underscore Stamper, both of us from the Teach Better team welcoming you in wherever you might be live, exclusively in our Sunday weekly warm-up space streaming in the Teach Better private Facebook group. We're excited that you're here. If you're joining us live, please say hello in the comments. And do remember to let StreamYard share your name and grant StreamYard permission. There's a little link and a little window. Grant StreamYard permission to let us know who you are so we can give you a shout out of appreciation for joining us tonight live on the Sunday weekly warm-up. Josh and I will be back right after this. Stay tuned. Hey, Teach Better family, welcome. You're in the Sunday Weekly warm -up Space, streaming exclusively in the Teach Better private Facebook group. You're with Brad Hughes and Joshua, triple underscore stamper. Joshua, I'm so excited that you're here tonight joining us in the Sunday Weekly warm -up Space. How are you, brother? Buddy, you say triple every time. It's double underscore. Did I say triple? <laughs> I'm at, at this point, I just think it's a joke that you're just playing on me. <laughs> But yeah, it's double underscore. I think the, I think maybe uh, I kind of backtrack and say <laughs> Joshua double underscore stamper. Josh, you know I just hold you in such high esteem that it's not double, not triple, it's quadruple. I mean, I'm just there. You go. I, I'm 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 not I'm not overselling. You are the real deal, <laughs> and uh, I'm really glad that you're here and uh, welcome into the space. How are you and family this evening in beautiful Colorado? Oh my goodness, we just got so much snow yesterday that uh, we're trying to dig ourselves out at this point but no it's it's beautiful it's fantastic the the family's doing wonderful and uh yeah everyone's just getting ready to for school tomorrow and i mean to brave the cold good evening to brian joining us from washington state brian we are so grateful that you're here week after week sending us greetings from snoqualmie washington and great to see joshua here and it's great to see all of you here if you are joining us live in the space make sure you let us know who you are where you are, let us know what's coming up for you as you look ahead to your week in education. Questions for me and Joshua, as Joshua said off stage, he's an open book. He's got lots of books. He's surrounded by books. I'm, I'm pretty much an open book. Uh, you can read me cover to cover. Uh, and uh, both Joshua and I have the spine for any questions you want to send our way. We want to help set you up for a great week in education. And Joshua, tell me a little bit about your weekend and how you and family spent the weekend in Colorado. Oh, for sure, man. Well, actually, can I tell you a story? It was a little bit of a scare here in the household. So I let the I let the dogs out. We have two dogs and one of them is very, very old. He's 15 years old. He's been with the family forever. And so just as soon they're outside, boys typically let them in whenever they're barking, ready to come inside. So I saw the youngest one, who's a very large dog. And then my old dog, I assumed was in the house. And so I have six kids for those who don't know. So it's a crazy household doing, you know, all kinds of things this weekend. And then I noticed that the older dog, I, I didn't see him anywhere in the house. And so I went outside and we have a dog run and it's fenced and we have a, a wooden wall that's typically about three, three and a half feet high. And because he's old, he just has never challenged it before. And so I'm searching high and low in the house, outside the house. And then I realized he's gotten out. And so I had to go all through the neighborhood we jumped in the van drove around as a family searching for him and he's he's old so he's deaf and so we can't call for him because he wouldn't hear us and so after about an hour of looking i, I sent an email to the hoa uh hoping that you know maybe a, a neighbor had found him and, and brought him into the garage of the house and crazy enough i had a, a veterinarian place uh, nearby call my phone and they uh, had a good Samaritan that, that brought our dog Baxter in and he was chipped. And so yeah. that's how they got the number. And I forgot about the chip, but yeah. So coordinated with the good Samaritan to, you know, have them bring 
the dog back to the house. But it was probably about, you know, two, two and a half hours of the family frantically trying to find our dog. But, you know, there's a good side to the story, which is that he is now safe at home right before the snowstorm. <laughs> it sounds like a pretty big day is, uh, is, was that Baxter? Yeah, it was Baxter. Yeah. So is, is, is Baxter uh, resting comfortably right now after such a big day? Well, he got a little spoiled. He actually wound up uh, across the street of the neighborhood by a business and they yeah. had fed him all kinds of ridiculous things that he probably has never eaten in his life. And so, yeah, I think he was actually probably happier over there because they were treating him like a king. I'm so glad that Baxter's okay. And that would have been really scary for your family. Oh, yeah. And, you know, trying to consult the kids and be like, it's okay. <laughs> like, we'll find them, you know, and trying to have kind of a p positive mindset moving forward. Uh, but yeah, Brian, I'm so sorry that it's terrible when you are, you know, losing a pet. And so, you know, I sent a, an email to the neighborhood, the neighborhood folks were looking for him too. So it, it was quite a, a scene. But like I said, it all was all good for, for the kids and the family to find him and have him back home. Josh, for those that are watching and may not know you well yet, you're a fantastic guy to get to know for so many reasons. Not only your commitment to family, community, education, but you're an author, a podcaster, a consultant. You're a training and development specialist with Teach Better. Hey, I'm, I'm stealing your big thunder here. Let, let me, <laughs> I want to give you a, a second just to, to reintroduce yourself to our family and community and, and let everyone know what you're all about. Well, I appreciate those kind words, Brad. So yeah, in education, I was, uh, you know, I've been in education for 18 years. I started off as an art teacher, a coach, then uh, got tapped on the shoulder and became a dean of students and then an assistant principal and was an assistant principal for nine years prior to moving over to being the Teach Better, well, being on the Teach Better team with, as you said, the training development specialist like yourself. And yeah, I get to do a whole lot of different things on the team as far as the podcast network. We do the admin mastermind every Tuesday morning. And then I do a lot of other things as far as training and then courses, a lot of online stuff with social media design, and then of course our courses. So yeah, I've got my hands on a lot of projects, but uh, you had t mentioned, you know, family, obviously I have a phenomenal wife, Leslie here, who's watching the kids as we speak. And I've got six crazy and wonderful kids uh, all the way from 16 to two. So we have a wide range. And then, uh, yeah, I guess I have two dogs also. And yeah, I just love what I'm doing. I've got uh, the podcast, the the book also on the side, uh, Aspire to Lead. So for those who are looking to enhance their leadership journey, there's definitely resources that I have available for you. Tell me more about uh, your family and how it's grown over the years and how you've made your way and found your way from uh, California to Minnesota to Texas and now to uh, Colorado. <laughs> oh, my man. Uh, the, it's a crazy journey uh, for for being a kid, uh, you know, I, I was born in California, loved it there. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, my my parents decided that we were going to make a move. And so it was kind of a crazy story. We we jumped into our family station wagon in the 80s and uh, they decided, hey, we're going to drive around the United States and wherever you like it, uh, that's where we're going to land. And so uh, it was interesting that we ended up in Minnesota um, in the summer, <laughs> mind you, where it's absolutely beautiful at that time of year. And uh, yeah, we fell in love with it as a family. And so we drove back to California. We packed up the U-Haul and two weeks later, we, we ended up there. So majority of my childhood was in Minnesota. You know, if you ask me where I'm from, that's, that's what I'm going to tell you. Um, that's where I went to college and that's where I met Leslie. And eventually, you know, the economy crashed. And so uh, we were kind of searching for jobs. I was looking for a teaching job, uh, specifically in the art department. And so uh, my in-laws lived in Texas and they were like, hey, come on down. The economy's great. You're you're bound to find a job down here. I wasn't thinking that was possible. So I was like, sure, we'll go down. We'll go down for a weekend. And if we, we get a job over the weekend, then we'll, we'll definitely go. Leslie's a nurse. So like right away, she got a job and then I landed a, an art position also. So we, we moved like my parents, I guess we hopped on a, a, a plane and, and came down. And so we found a house, um, got everything set up. And so we spent the last 16 years um, in Texas, um, that's where our family has grown. You asked about the kids. Uh, we have two biological children, but we also fostered for 12 years and have adopted four children. So um, we've been extremely, extremely blessed in that situation. Um, a lot of the training that I got with the foster care system is something that I implemented as administrator. And yeah, it's just been just a, a beautiful thing. M Leslie and I always talked about retiring in Colorado. <laughs> and, you know, once I got the job with Teach Better Team, it was pretty evident that 
I didn't need to still be in Texas. And so uh, we had talked to our kids and yeah, we, we made the shift over here and it's been a beautiful transition for everybody. Josh, can you take me back to a time uh, when you and Leslie had two kids of your own and the, there, I'm wondering if there was a calling or an opportunity or what led you uh, to become foster parents? Yeah, it was kind of, it definitely was a calling. Um, I would say, you know, we, we go to church every Sunday. And so one of the messages was on adoption. And all of a sudden, a lot of our friends uh, had either adopted or they were foster parents. Um, and so it just kept coming up. It was kind of a weird situation for about a month where we just had these interactions. There was things on TV. It was, it was just like we couldn't get away from it. And so uh, Leslie and I continue to have conversations about that. Originally, we had looked at adoption overseas. Uh, for those who don't know, there's a lot of time that is required of you. Um, sometimes it's six months all the way up to a year. And then, of course, there's a lot of financial demand um, in addition to that. And so for where our family was and where we were, um, it just made sense to look here in our backyard. And when we started doing the research, when we started to have conversations or we even had uh, lunch at someone's house that were foster parents and just kind of picked their brains. And it was very evident that there were thousands of children that were in our city um, that needed homes. And so it was kind of a no-brainer for us to, to go through that process. And so, yeah, we started to look for agencies and found one that we liked. And yeah, then we started to do all the training. Uh, CPS requires a lot of paperwork and a lot of your time as far as trying to make sure that you're vetted, to that you're a good home uh, for these kids. And so um, with that, we got licensed and we, we were an emergency license. So what that means is that they could call you at two in the morning and say, hey, we have a kiddo. Would you be available to, to take them in? And, and wow. a couple of times we've, we've had some in the middle of the night uh, placements for our family. But yeah, it was definitely a calling for us. And it's been, like I said, a, a huge blessing for our family. How did you cultivate the mindset uh, with, with you and Leslie uh, and your kids? How did you cultivate the mindset that allowed you to be open to a middle of the night call to welcome a stranger into your home, into your family? Yeah, I think we both have service hearts. I mean, yep. Leslie's a nurse, I said, uh, you know, I'm obviously been a teacher and administrator in education. So for us, we just felt like, you know, if there's a kid in a situation that they need to be out of immediately, then who are we to say no? Like we have a home, we've got the extra rooms. Uh, so, you know, taking our blessings and being able to provide that to someone else has always been something that we've been open to. And so, you know, similar to growing up, <laughs> my parents asking about our two cents as far as where we wanted to live. It was very yeah. much the same with our two biological children. We've always had those conversations prior to, uh, before taking a placement, you probably hear one of the beautiful babies in the background too, screaming. Yeah. Uh, she's definitely found her voice. And so the, you know, the situation's always been like getting there, their ideas, you know, is it okay? And we were always very concerned about how that relationship between the kids and us, if they felt slighted or anything like that. And it's actually been such a, a huge like mindset shift for them too, like um, in a positive way, like when people ask them about growing up and, you know, do you want kids and whatnot? They talk about how many biological kids they want and how many adopted kids they, they want also. So um, it, it's definitely impressed them in a good way. Um, and it's, it's something that, although we were worried about it on the back end of it, it's been a very good thing for them. And I think, you know, seeing that every day, modeling it of opening our home and then also just sharing love with, you know, a, a child that isn't biological has been a, I don't know, a positive thing in their life. We're going to shift right after the break, Josh, to our Sunday strategies segment. Uh, helping educators watching, listening live, or maybe listening and watching later, uh, whether it's on an episode of Teach Better Talk or on any one of the socials, finding out what we need to make the very best for ourselves and for our students in the week ahead. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, Teach Better family. You're with Brad Hughes and Josh Stamper in the Sunday weekly warm up space. We're streaming live exclusively in our Teach Better private Facebook group on Facebook and streaming later as a episode of the Teach Better Talk podcast. And we're available on all of the socials, whether it's Tweetster or Tube Time or Bookface or Instagram, whatever. It, you pick, you name it. We're we're streaming somewhere, uh, 24 hours from now, Josh. And uh, we've shifted into our Sunday strategy section, and we were having a great conversation before the break about your uh, your life's work as an educator, as a family member, and you were talking about some important training that you and your family, I guess, were required, obligated to do as as new foster family. And I know that that training has led directly into a commitment and a passion of yours as an educator, as a leader but now as an author and podcaster, and that is trauma-informed practices. Tell me a little bit about how much that means to you and, and what are you seeing in education and schools right now, 2024, where trauma-informed practices are really needed and valued? Oh, for sure. So I was going through a very difficult time at the moment. Uh, it was kind of perfect timing as a Dean of students. So a Dean of students in Texas is you're, you essentially have all of the discipline for the student body. And so, you know, for 1200 kids, it was quite a, a big job. And so in addition to that, we were also having a, a kind of a shift in the community that was having a lot of, of issues and we're bringing onto the campus. And so we were suspending kids left and right. I was either putting them in ISS or I was sending them out in OSS out back, back into the community. And then they were also getting into trouble out there. And so um, I was like, man, there's got to be a different way to do things. And so at that time, I was actually going through uh, foster training with Professor Purvis at TCU. And they had talked about kind of this, you know, shift as far as looking at uh, things in a little bit different way with trauma informed practices. And so um, kind of seeking the emotional aspect of things and teaching behavior versus just punishing. And so I was really just thinking like, there's, there's something here. And we're doing all these different strategies and things with, with our kids and foster care, but why are we not doing the exact same thing in the school system? And that was kind of where my charge came. And so I came back pretty fired up to the campus and talked to my principal, my AP, and I was like, hey, we're looking at the data and it's only increasing. We're having upset students. We're having upset parents. And there's a whole lot of things going on that's increasing as far as poor behavior and choices. So, you know, is there something that we could do different? And would you be fine if I started to, to figure this out? And so they definitely said, okay, let's try it. You know, what can we lose right at this point? Cause our ISS room is full um, and we were sending kids out all the time. So uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the charge. That's the training that I received um, in addition to some other things. Um, but a lot of it was like de-escalation strategies. A lot of things that it's, um, you know, as a teacher, as an administrator, I never got taught. It was just something that, you know, here, here you get in this role and, um, you know, just figure it out. And so uh, I always just assumed that I had a detention ISS and OSS uh, in my toolbox. And honestly, that's kind of what the teachers thought too. And that was the expectation was that I would only use those three tools. And as we know, in the classroom is when it comes to standards and trying to master those, like we have a lot of tools in our, to our disposal and, when it comes to behavior, it's not really about teaching. And so, yeah, that's kind of when I was trying to shift the mindset on our campus, but then also change the the policies and the ways that we, we reacted to misbehavior. I'd love you to think about uh, educating and leading uh, a school community through the pandemic beginning in uh, 2020. And then I'm not sure whether we're really post pandemic. I know that uh, COVID is still prevalent in our communities, but I'm curious what your take is as an educator, as a school leader, and also, you know, someone involved with Teach Better Team who's, you know, kind of got your finger on the pulse of any number of districts uh, around the country, around the world, about post-COVID community stress and distress. I mean, the incredible stress that uh, kids and families encountered, uh, displacement, removal from school, school closures, uh, interruption of education, interruption of learning, interruption of, of all the things that uh, are meant to bring us together, whether it's athletics, social events, uh, family outings. And now we have a reckoning where we're returning to schools. Uh, and I, I'm wondering what you think the role of trauma-informed practices is or will continue to be as we reckon with that return to school, which is a couple of years in now. 
Yeah, it's essentially that ripple effect, right, Brian? I mean, we we definitely saw it uh, during the pandemic. Uh, Texas, <laughs> we were one of the first states to get kids back on campus. And man, did we feel it because, you know, for a lot of our students, and I, I know this isn't everyone, but for our communities, a lot of our students were home alone. You know, the, the families were either in their office doing virtual uh, office hours and whatnot, uh, working from home, or they were required to go back to work also where the students were still online. So what we saw was, you know, our, our middle school students whose brains are growing like crazy really got into this mindset of I can do what I want when I want. <laughs> so why on earth are you tell me what to do? And so it was almost like kind of retraining of like the system and, and them getting, you know, back into um, some of the, the school practices. And so for us, it was very, um, important to make sure that, you know, our, our students and our, specifically our teachers, like learned real powerful communication skills, effective, um, really we're trying to build on, you know, the, the relationship aspect of things, because that was so much more important. Um, you know, the days of a kid running down the hall and just yelling at them, <laughs> telling them to, to stop and, you know, give them the business. I mean, if they, if you didn't have a relationship with them, I mean, what we were finding out was the kid would just blow up and escalate quickly and potentially throw some expletives out. So yeah. it was like, one of these things is like, no, we, we need to change everything. So, you know, before the pandemic, almost 70% of students had at least one form of trauma. Now with the pandemic where people were losing their jobs, you know, they had someone close to them probably die. I mean, there were a lot of other stresses that were going on. Uh, the divorce rate went up. So like all these, these forms of trauma that were occurring during this time span, of course, we're going to see the effects on the campus. So it's extremely important uh, for us um, to make sure that, you know, we had the skills and also that we were not just going back to, Hey, let's, let's go back to what we were used to before. Um, no, this is, this is different. So we started to do a lot of different things as far as like relationship um uh, agreements with the, the students and doing circles, uh, relationship circles and f doing brain breaks and find ways for our teachers to really get to know our kids. Um, and not just like the first week of school, but like every single day, you know? So, uh, you know, that's just a couple of the practices that we implemented, but it was very evident very quickly uh, that trauma informed was something that we needed campus wide. What advice do you have for educators that might be watching and listening that are addressing their own traumatic experiences, addressing their own distress, whether it has yep. to do with uh, the pandemic or uh, family, community, uh, workplace stress. Like I'm wondering the, what the role is in, in addressing the stress and the anxiety or trauma that educators may feel before they are in a position to address uh, the, the trauma-informed students in, that they serve. No, I think that's a great uh, piece there, Brad, because that's something that I've, I've talked to administrators a lot about is the fact that we're so focused on students, which we should, but our teachers are going through a lot also. And there's got to be ways for us to, to use the same strategies um, on our campus with our, with our teachers. And so, um, you know, unfortunately mental health is, is got kind of a, a slice on a lot of campuses and just in society uh, as far as uh, I can give you a story now of like, we had a teacher that was going through a lot of, difficult things, um, just even getting out of bed was, was a struggle. And so, you know, finding empathy from the administrative point of view of, you know, allowing them to um, have time and, and get connected with HR to figure out what that was going to look like, but giving them grace in that, knowing that this is just going to hopefully be a short period of time for them to get through it. And, you know, being by their side where, unfortunately, the peer teachers were not <laughs> very empathetic to the situation, uh, a lot of guilt, a lot of anger, a lot of emotions of, you know, we're, we're having more work on us. So, you know, make sure that you're here all the time. And so, you know, I think as far as the trauma informed strategies that we had with our students, uh, we definitely need to make sure that we have with our staff. And so, um, you know, a lot of times teachers are going through things we don't even know of. I, I can think of a time a, a teacher came in, you know, she was not in a very good state. You know, once we start talking out, she was going through a really rough, rough divorce and it was happening for a while. I, I had no clue of it because she showed up every day. She had a smile on her face. She went in front of the class and did a beautiful job with her kids. But it obviously it was weighing on her to the point where she was 
breaking. And so, you know, to, to give her that, that time to, to share, but then also, you know, if you need some time off, take it, like we, we can offer that, you know, what is it that you need? Is it, you know, and our staff was, did a beautiful job of this of, okay, do you need meals? Do you need, to, you know, for us to take your kids and babysit them for a time and, you know, trying to find that support system to, to get the resources that they need as a, as a teacher, just as much as we try to get the resources to our kids. What would you say to an educator that is looking to, I guess, build a stronger or closer or a more trusting relationship uh, with the school leaders on his or her uh, campus, Josh? Well, hopefully the, the, the administrators have an open door policy. I know that doesn't always occur, but I think getting to know people at, at a human level is always the best piece, right? Of, you know, to, to get anything like as far as a, a relationship, you got to go through the heart. And so, you know, I know for myself, sometimes, you know, I would get bogged down in my office just with parents and, and student issues and uh, email and whatnot. And so, you know, when a teacher, you know, just poke their head in and, you know, how are you doing? What can I do for you? And, you know, that type of thing that goes a long way for administrator. A lot of, a lot of leaders feel like they're on an Island. So, you know, when, when they start to notice that there's more people <laughs> within their surroundings, I think that's always extremely helpful. And, uh, you know, everyone's got a different love language, but you know, it's, it was always, you know, a bright spot to my day to have some pop in and here's some spark Starbucks. I, I just picked up, you know, I, I thought of you, you know, types of things like that. Um, always, you know, generate conversations um, for myself as a leader. You know, I, I was very intentional about trying to have conversations outside of just like, you know, the rubrics and the tests and the uh, curriculum. So, you know, I was actually trying to make relationship walks and trying to make touch points with my staff so that I could get to know them as people, not just as, you know, a person given instruction. So um, I think it kind of goes both ways as far as teachers to administrators, but administrators definitely to teachers. I'd love to pick up on that idea of relationship walks because mm -hmm. I think that's something that anyone in any walk of life in any workplace can kind of pick up and adopt. What about a challenge to those watching and listening, Josh, in terms of reframing the way we move around our workplaces, whether it's a hallway, a classroom, a staff room, a library, a schoolyard, uh, a, a pickup and drop off line? How might we reframe the way we move around our spaces to focus more on relationships in the coming week? Yeah, I think it's so interesting because like when I would walk down a hall, people would be like, how are you doing? And I was on a destination. So I'd be like, great, even though I might be doing terrible. <laughs> right? So I think as a, just a social norm, I think most people just say good or great just to get through whatever short interaction that is. Um, but for myself, like I want to go beyond that. I didn't want to have, you know, an opportunity to go to waste. So you know, I always talk about touch points, uh, similar to, you know, I grew up playing soccer. So like in a soccer game, it's a 90 minute soccer match, but you know, as far as amount of time that you touch the ball is typically about 90 seconds, okay. 60 to 90 seconds, which is really, really small. Same thing as an administrator, like in a school day, I, well, I will be there for eight hours to 10 hours, some days, 15 hours, if there's like an event afterwards. Right. So I have only small touch points with my teachers where some days I might only have 15 to 30 seconds with them. So am I doing the correct thing in as far as getting to know them and making sure that they have a positive relationship built within that small, short period of time? So I wanted to extend that, right? I might only get 15 or 30 natural seconds, but if I'm being intentional, which I was doing those relationship walks, well, then I had a spreadsheet. I know it's a dirty word for a lot of people in education, but I had a spreadsheet with all of my staff trying to make sure that I was putting down exactly when I saw them and then it was going in there and saying, yes, how are you doing? No, how are you doing? <laughs> like truly what it was going on in your life and getting to, to know them more as people, not just an employee that needs to do X, Y, and Z. I uh, think that spreadsheet idea just really gives you a foundation of intentionality. Yes. Intentionality for making those visits uh, meaningful and purposeful and whatever your important role in education may be this week, Josh and I absolutely encourage you to get those feelers out there and find out how the people around you are doing. And as you said, Josh, how they're really doing. Ask that second question. Just take a pause and say, you know, how are you really doing? Because in our busy lives with the blinders on, we can always be thinking about what we need to do first, next, then finally, uh, without really checking in with ourselves and checking in with others. And 
that leads us to our Sunday Spark. Our Sunday Spark is coming up right after this. And Josh, you get to weigh in on which Sunday Spark is featured tonight. Stay tuned. Welcome, everybody, and welcome back. You're with Joshua Stamper and Brad Hughes, both of the Teach Better team, and welcome back to the Sunday Weekly Warm-Up, streaming exclusively in the Teach Better private Facebook group and streaming later this week as an episode of Teach Better Talk podcast. If you're listening on Teach Better Talk, welcome. Thanks for joining us, or maybe you're joining us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, X, or even TikTok. Joshua, do we have a TikTok presence on the Teach Better team? I have no clue, buddy. I, I barely have a TikTok presence myself. <laughs> well, TikTok times a wasting. It's time for our Sunday Spark, Josh. And the Sunday Spark is designed to uh, help you meet others and, and meet others in your workspace with uh, with a spark, with a spark of conversation, a spark of inspiration, uh, whatever your important role might be. I've got three options for you. And, and uh, I want to see if anyone watching and listening would like to chime in with their choice. Uh, we've got three options for our Sunday Spark story. The first one I'm calling when in Rome, when in Rome. The second one I'm calling out to lunch, out to lunch. And finally, a whaley big deal, a whaley big deal. What's coming to mind for you? When in Rome, out to lunch or whaley big deal? For myself, I like out to lunch. That got me to laugh. So Okay. Oh, and and uh, Brian Arnott uh, of Washington State. There also you go, Brian. Brian. I think we've got a winner out to lunch. So this is a, a feel good story, a human interest story. And uh, just bear with me. I'm going to make sure that we have that screen ready to present. Uh, this is a human interest story out to lunch. Stay tuned with me. There we go. Just going to make sure if you are watching live, you can see and uh, take a look at the story. Uh, this comes from sunnyskies.com. And the headline reads, customer sends letter and cash to restaurant after realizing his mistake. I read this story earlier this week and thought it was worth bringing to our Sunday Spark. It's a heartwarming display of honesty and kindness. A customer at Poor House Side Street Bar and Grill realized after checking his credit card statement that he had forgotten to leave a tip for their lunch. And so what happened next really sets the story apart. The customer upon realizing the oversight, went the extra mile by writing a heartfelt letter to Side Street Poor House and Grill, expressing their apologies and enclosing a $20 tip for the server. With humble apologies to you and to Hope, the server, the customer says, I hope this goes a distance to recognizing and rectifying the mistake. And uh, that's uh, out to lunch. Out to lunch recognizing you haven't left your tip and not only providing the tip after the fact, but writing a letter of apology and appreciation as well. It, moments of appreciation are all around us. And Josh, as you look forward to your week ahead, uh, what are you appreciating or what are you uh, feeling grateful about as you uh, look ahead to Monday morning? Oh my goodness. Just appreciate this conversation with you, Brad. I mean, I don't know if everyone understands how much I enjoy my time with you, but <laughs> I, I get to record with you on the Inspired Elite podcast once a month now for 2024. But then sure also, do. you know, the Teach Better team has bingo cards and I pretty much have every square that says spend more time with Brad Hughes. So <laughs> you're filling my cup, buddy. I'm feeling really grateful, too, uh, that you're able to join me tonight uh, in the middle of a busy family Sunday evening in Colorado. And I, I'm feeling very hopeful about the week ahead. And and Josh, what kind of things have you got planned for the week? Uh, connecting with podcast guests or yes. doing some recordings or some writing or what's on your plate? All the above, buddy. So, you know, the, the topic that we've had today, uh, I have a project right now. Um, hopefully it's trying to get a second book together. So I uh, started oh. writing that. So I'll be writing some more this week. But yeah, I have a couple of podcast guests and then we're all obviously uh, adding to our podcast network. So I'm trying to get them onboarded and onto the Teach Better website so if you go to teachbear.com slash podcast uh, we'll have some more you know podcasts up and running for for those for those folks and then 
yes, we have a lot of snow, um, but it's melting. So that's a good sign. Um, so we'll have warm weather and, you know, my family is extremely active. So we'll definitely be getting outside and hopefully getting on the mountains hiking soon. Josh, your book is Aspire to Lead. Your podcast mm -hmm. is Aspire. And uh, how can people get in touch and stay in touch with you and all of the awesome things that you do? Oh, my goodness. So obviously my my handle there, Joshua Dove underscore Stamper, or you can go Joshua at teachbetter.com is, uh, is my email. Uh, you can go to joshstamper.com. You know, there's a, a contact section in there, too, and you can find all the things that I do um, on that site. And Or you can go to you know teachbetter.com and go over there to uh, – meet the team. So uh, I'm one of those, those boxes there <laughs> with all our information. Uh, so those are probably the, the best ways to, to contact or get a hold of me. Honestly, friends, you know, Josh and I are really only a message away. If we can support yes. your work in any way, if we can be a source of inspiration, mm -hmm. reassurance, uh, guidance, uh, education, or learning, we love connecting with you live. We love connecting with you after the fact, please do hit us up if we can be of any support and make sure that you are subscribing to everything teach better has to offer all of that over on teachbetter.com. Joshua double underscore stamper. Always a pleasure to connect with you, buddy. And my bingo card is full. My heart is full after a wonderful conversation with you. Wishing you a great week ahead, Josh. To you too, Brad. Appreciate you. Thanks for watching and listening. Everyone remember teach better today streams live tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. Eastern on Facebook and all the socials, YouTube. Join us each day, Sunday, weekly warm-up each Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern. Thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful week ahead. Talk soon.